Thank you all for coming. This is workshop number four, Maximizing Solar in Your Community. So in this workshop, we, we're going to hear from three different speakers about ways to uh, maximize adoption of solar across your community using different approaches. We'll hear about um, cooperative approaches to community ownership of solar from Ernesto Cruz. Paul Newland will discuss Waitley's Municipal Solarize Program and Zara, Zara Dowling will discuss financial zoning and planning approaches to promoting solar in your community. Um, so our first speaker is Ernesto Cruz, the manager um, uh, at Co-op Power, and he is a grassroots community organizer from Springfield who has worked in the Massachusetts House of Representatives as a le legislative aide. Through volunteering with local campaigns and organizations, he's learned about the needs of the community where he lived. He was ad advocating for democratic representation on local issues like climate change, police oversight, and participatory budgeting in between taking on staff roles in local, state, and federal elections. He curr is currently the statewide policy coordinator at Neighbor to Neighbor Massachusetts, helping to develop legislation around housing, solidarity economy, and climate justice for a member organization. He serves as the board secretary for Co-op Power, representing the Hamden Community Energy Cooperative, and believes that engaging communities in economic development for renewable energy in homes that are ready for <coughs> the impacts of climate change is the path towards a more equitable and sustainable environment for all. So Ernesto. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Um, yeah, so I'll, just a little bit of background on me and my time with Co-op Power. I've, I've been with Co-op Power since, I, th I believe, the, the end of 2018, uh, at least for sure since 2019. I was not expecting to be involved in the, the cooperative space or in the climate space. I had been working as a legislative aide. Then I was working for myself, uh, working on renovating houses. And I, I was sort of recruited by a lot of people in, in the community to come in and, and uh, help out on the community side of things. So taking those organizing skills and applying it to uh, ensuring that we're who we say we are, ensuring that we get communities all across the, the, the multicultural, uh, multi-generational uh, spectrum to make sure that everyone has a voice. So. That was my introduction into the organization. Uh, Co-op Power is a regional network of community energy cooperatives in New England and New York, and it's focused on uh, community ownership. So there's this concept of energy democracy, where we want to ensure that people have participation in their energy decisions, and that's something that is a, a really big paradigm shift that takes a lot of work, a lot of consideration, uh, but something we are dedicated to doing. So what's a community energy cooperative? Um, so the purpose of the cooperative is to realize the economic, cultural, and social needs of the organization's members and its surrounding communities. Uh, they develop, finance, so, and support community ownership of renewable energy projects, and they generate political and economic power for the future. So uh, that, that means a lot of working with existing anchor organizations, anchor institutions, uh, but also having representation for normal folks. Uh, so we're a consumer-owned cooperative, which means that our members are our owners, and we want to make sure that those consumers, those uh, members of the cooperative, have a say directly at the board level. So we give them an opportunity to actually be on the board. If you are a member, you have that opportunity to run for a seat and to be a part of it. And they're organized by region or around the renewable energy project. So. If there's not already a region that's in existence, if you have a project, that's usually how it comes about. Someone contacts us and says they want to try something new or they've been looking at the cooperative model and they, they want to collectively purchase uh, an asset or create an asset, that's where we come in and, and provide that assistance. And so here's an example of something that we've done, and this is the Franklin CEC around Northeast Biodiesel. So this is a newly formed worker owner cooperative, and it should be uh, kicking off in May 2022. Uh, the, plant from, the plant will make biodiesel from used cooking oil as a transition fuel uh, as we get away from fossil fuels. 
and uh, you know, and also for for uh, housing. A lot of a lot of boilers, a lot of heaters are still oil, and we're also looking to uh, for for especially in buildings. Um, like for example, New York, a, a lot of those buildings have really old systems, and so a transition fuel until we get geothermal, until we get solar everywhere, is is the way to go. So community solar, it's a way for households to join a single shared solar energy system and receive solar credits on the bill. And community solar allows to access discounted solar energy for low income households who may rent or can't afford solar on their roof. Oftentimes if you're a renter, you can't really decide what your, uh, where, your, um, where your panels are. So what you can do is you can either subscribe from someone else's, uh, from someone else's array but that doesn't give you the opportunity for ownership, and we really believe ownership is the difference between uh, the future and what we've been doing in the past, and to have that uh, solidarity. And so that is our model. Another example of some work we've done is uh, the Hampshire CEC worked on the River Valley Co-op uh, array over there, and you can see it's over the parking lot. It's a 930 kilowatt canopy and rooftop to serve 100 low-income households aside from uh, the River Valley Co-op. Here's, you can see PV Squared was also here, uh, helped install this. The Hampshire CEC, they have the West Hampton Co-op Community Shared Solar Garden, and so that's four families came together, developed their own array, so that's another example of the type of the work that we do. And so uh, uh, we're looking to get away from a capitalist approach of solar development, and, and really, in the solar space, if you're not talking about profit, it, it's it's it doesn't really it doesn't really connect with folks. So that whole paradigm about uh, energy being a human right, right? Like there's so many people who are not receiving uh, dialysis or oxygen or whatever it may be because of uh, not being able to pay their bills or not being able to uh, to afford to be in a place where there is electricity. And this is more over the, across the country. Uh, but this is something that we've got to change that paradigm uh, because people deserve to have their, their energy. And also, like, as we're moving towards a singularity, uh, you know, it's, we have corporations using AI to think for them. Meanwhile, people can't even get their oxygen. <laughs> so there's a really huge divide. And sometimes that divide between rich and poor is larger than what we think it is when you think about the, uh, how important technology is in our lives. So we see here there's a professional sales force develops a solar project. Then there's empowerment through purchasing expertise. You see over here the tax equity inve investors and uh, DOE loans available only to large solar projects. So people don't have even access to get in here. And then there's the uh, community env environmental extraction. So those smart incentives are going not to the communities impacted most, but they're going to who has the money to invest. So it's like all of those benefits, uh, all those tax loopholes, um, tax expenditures, they all go to corporations or individuals that already have enough to, to live off of. And then there's finally the, uh, the wealth building for the corporation. So here we have for-profit ownership builds corporate wealth, often taking it out of the state or country. So just so imagine um, a vacuum cleaner just sucking out all of the wealth out of that tax revenue that goes into the uh, into the system. And then there's the cooperative approach to solar development. And so every CEC member is a solar developer through the assistance and the, uh, so staff really does the work of being a solar developer, but the cooperative is the owner. So that's where they're, they have an ownership stake. They get to learn and, and be advocated for. They can ask questions. Uh, then when it comes to the aggregation of costs and financing, you know, dividing the, the, the cost amongst everyone makes it easier to access financing and insurance through People's Solar Energy Fund and other, uh, other financing. There's empowerment through the workforce development and co-op business support, so training for a renewable energy economy and supporting the cooperative economy uh, comes through working together. And uh, like for me, I've had all sorts of uh, opportunities that I would have never had otherwise. So. Uh, you know, me coming from like a community organizing background, being able to be inside of a, uh, a board with high level uh, thinkers who understand a, a balance sheet, profit and loss statement, all these things I've, I've 
never even thought about as I was just advocating. You get a chance to like be a part of something and learn things that you know they they, they make an impact. It has a it has a domino effect. There's other people that are now affected by my being a part of it, and other individuals who are also a part of it. There's that sort of compound effect. It grows exponentially. And then finally, the empowerment through community wealth building and governance. So again, this is that important part where community ownership builds wealth inside the CEC to reinvest everywhere else. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking to have strong CECs. That takes time. It's uh, something that is, uh, it is not easy. <laughs> you know, there's like so many cultural differences that we have to work through and understand and learn. Uh, but as we go through that process, it's like things even out and now we have more education on the community end. So that's very helpful. And so a cooperative energy movement, we're looking at the CEC criteria for governance and solar development. That's where we uh, develop a criteria for, for how we move forward together. Uh, Co-op Power Common Office does a project management, uh, People Solar Energy Fund, which is a, a they, they collect all the financing in order to uh, do the pre-dev, because pre-dev for, for solar projects is a lot of money, so we want to make sure people get that entry into it, and that forms a broader economic movement that's national and international. And so, you know, we, we provide a 15% discount on solar electricity for low-income Eversource customers. Uh, this is one thing that we've got right now, and if you'd like to be a part of it or know anyone, uh, definitely contact solar at coopower.coop. Uh, it, it's for people who live in Western Mass. They receive their electric bill through Eversource, um, and they have to qualify for Mass Health Snap, LIHEAP, or some other social program. And that is it. I can answer any questions. Um, I believe we've got some time for that. <laughs> yes. I may not know the answer to this, but um, a while back I got noticed that the town of Deerfield was developing a site here to Duh, for solar, and I wonder, is that a community solar development? I don't know what happened to it because it doesn't seem to be happening, but um, was that to be a community solar development, or was that more of a standard? I am not sure. Yeah. It, it depends on who the off-takers are for it, who owns it. Um, so if, if you could figure out who owned it, then you can determine if it was for the, the purpose of community. It uh, is currently pending um, approval by the utility, but uh, next year we can develop a community shared solar on the land to control the land. So it is it, it is. It's not quite the. I, I really like this model of non capitalist cooperative. It is more of the capitalist model, but it is. Shared, you don't own a portion of it. You don't own a panel. You don't own a panel. Yeah. They, they sell you a squiggle. But it will be the cheapest way to get power down and join that town and send local soul. Do you still have um, regional um, regular meetings for people to, if they wanted to get involved, um, like in Hampshire County or for? Yes. Yeah, so, like, uh, once a month, and I believe it's the last, uh, I believe it's the last Monday of the month, and I should know this because I'm the secretary, but it's, it's just on my calendar and I show up. Uh, I, I always, I receive the email, I prepare, I show up. Um, I, I sort of live like a zombie in that way. But we have, um, <laughs> we have uh, uh, CEC meetings regularly, and that's determined locally depending on where you live. Uh, some of the CECs are stronger than others because it really depends on like the type of uh, project. That's what really galvanizes and brings people together. Uh, but the regional it always meets, no matter what. No, uh, that's just uh, that's where we make the decisions that are, are more about the course of the organization generally. Um, and that, yeah, you, you'd be able to contact me or Marianne. Uh, Marianne's a manager at coopower.coop, and that would be, uh, yeah, so I'll go back to the first slide because that's Marianne's information. Um, yeah, contact Marianne if you'd like to get involved, but that's, that's where we've got, um, all, all the meetings, and so not not just regional, but also national. Uh, we are members of People Solar Energy Fund, which brings together funding for pre-development, as we said before. That's a great thing. And then I'm also uh, 
part of the Energy Democracy Project, which is also national, and that's a space where we talk about uh, the political the political limitations that are preventing us from from really developing solar cooperatives all across the country. Um, and so they, they've got 40 organizations from all across the country, very diverse organizations, that are looking to either uh, help develop the projects or that have a lot of grassroots connections and want to develop uh, on top of, like, let's say, a church or their organization or they've got a field. So uh, getting that done, you know, they, they've developed like a solar energy justice playbook. Uh, utilities often have all sorts of ways to get in between us and finishing a project. This is a way to break that down, uh, get help from across the country, and bring it here locally to make sure that we get these projects done. So that's just another sort of thing that we're connected to, and I think that that's also a big time value relative to co-op power in our model, is that we're not just here, we're also connected elsewhere, and that really helps us get things done. Yes? Well, I, I saw that hand first, so I just went with what I saw, but well, okay. yes, I, I don't have flyers with me now. I'm covering for, for Marianne. I know we may have sent some in for printing, but if not, you can go to coopower.coop, so yeah, coopower.coop, .co or, or really just contact Marianne. I think that's a, the best way to get started, and she'll connect you to the right person. So thanks for sharing today. Can you say a little bit more about how you're breaking down those walls with utilities? Because I know as you know, having TV panels on my house, they were less than welcoming. You know, they don't always make it easy. Yeah. Could you just say a little more about how you're breaking down? Well, that, that's, that's Across, well, here in Massachusetts, not so much. <laughs> we'll just say that. We, we've seen examples in other places where, depending on how the, uh, uh, like their, their version of the DOER works, they've been able to elect new people or to uh, make the appointments more transparent or uh, change the, the, the form of governance from, from the administration. So like those are really, it comes down to systems change. Uh, we, we have to change the rules at this point. Uh, like let's say in the Massachusetts State Legislature, the like for every for every 13 individuals is one lobbyist. <laughs> for it's like 13 to one, uh, you know, climate justice sort of organization. Uh, for every dollar, it's 13 to one, I believe. Um, everything gets killed in committee. The the utilities have an un just unreal influence on what happens with uh, the legislative process. So right here, it really comes down to changing those rules. Otherwise, there's really no, no hope. <laughs> so it's, it's something that groups are already working on. Uh, I know in my day job at Neighbor to Neighbor, uh, the Attorney General's office is bringing us in to talk about those uh, barriers to people contributing what they think or showing up to hearings and, and whatnot. It's just, it's a just general disenfranchisement. Uh, you know, you go, you speak to the to the panel, and, and then nothing changes. Uh, they they do what they want, and they're all appointed by people who have conflicts of interest. Just quite honestly, so uh, we're, we're taking a look at what has to happen to uh, unemotionally <laughs> and dispassionately look at the system and say, this is what it is, and this is what we've got to change. Sorry how you feel about it, but you know, um, go somewhere else. Yes. If Deerfield wanted to create a, a cooperative to um, power some of its municipal buildings and, for example, the senior housing, um, what would the steps be for doing that? Yeah, I, the way it's working right now is uh, if you have people together who know already that, that have some sort of a level of understanding, there would be a like, site selection process where we're just going to make sure that it's, it's viable, right? Uh, and if you don't know, you'd contact Marianne, and we'd bring in someone to take a look. Uh, if it's viable just on the surface, on the look of things, then we work together to bring some funding together to get someone to professionally look at uh, viability. Then that's where we start uh, looking to see where we can bring money together, either from the, uh, the members who want to do it, or from, uh, you know, like let's say financing, uh, loan funds, 
grant funding, whatever whatever it is, uh, to to get started on a process. And these processes can sometimes take several years. So it's 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 not for the faint of heart. <laughs> so it's like you have to be dedicated uh, and go through a lot of ups and downs to ensure that you get to the end of the project. But that's something that. Uh, it's getting easier. Um, I don't want to say it's easy at all, but it's it's getting. Uh, we're getting to a place where it's it's starting to come together, and I think that's just because the, the the way the uh, the legislation is changing, the way the the entire uh, the world is changing. It's like it, this is an inevitable change we've got to make. So it, you see, the tension is sort of lowering. Any other questions? Okay, we are we're done. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Ernesto. Okay, our next speaker is um, Paul Newland from the Waitley Energy Committee, and he's going to be talking about Solarize Waitley. Paul is currently the chair of the Waitley Energy Committee. He served on the select board for 12 years. He's on the Open Space Committee and the Trails Committee. Paul teaches um, economics at Smith College. Um, he's taught um, renewable energy engineering at Mount Wachusett College, as well as environment um, energy Environmental History and Policy at Smith, Amherst, and the University of Hartford. He served as co-director of the Franklin County Energy Task Force, and he has a degree in mechanical engineering with a concentration in renewable energy and energy conservation. So, good, good person to have. Thank you, Paul. All right, so I, I'm very excited having heard what Ernesto had to say about the development of solar and renewables in general, and especially his remarks about the relationship between the implementation of uh, renewable energy and utility regulation, or should I say, uh, obstruction. And um, I just wanted to um, uh, sort of cap what he was saying with a personal uh, anecdote having to do with that very subject. In 1978, a document was published called the Franklin County Energy Plan, and um, it was a very thick document done by a lot of uh, people at UMass researching the renewable energy for uh, potential for Franklin County and its 27 towns, and the conclusion was that we could be a net exporter of renewable energy by the year 2000. And so, as a result of the excitement of, of that document, uh, the Franklin County Task Force was formed shortly thereafter, and the select boards from each of the 27 towns sent a representative to the Franklin County Task Force, which meant every month, with the charge of developing uh, an energy platform for uh, following the soft paths of energy so that Franklin County could, in fact, realized that um, vision of being a net energy exporter, renewable energy exporter, by the year 2000. And so we worked uh, for several years on developing that, and um, um, we, were, we were coming up, we finally came up with the brilliant idea that, uh, that we should form a, um, uh, what did we call it, um, oh, an energy, uh, Energy Authority, the Franklin County Energy Authority. And we actually um, had lobbyists in Boston, well, not lobbyists, lawyers, okay, what's the difference? But lawyers at Ropes and Gray in Boston, which is a high-powered law firm in Boston, developed for us a bond issue for $4 million to implement and set up a, um, an energy uh, authority, which would have the authority to develop uh, renewable energy systems uh, currently, uh, currently at sites owned by utilities such as hydropower dams. There's a lot of micro hydro in Franklin County. Uh, we would also have developed wind power sites and done some biomass development and a lot of solar and insulation energy conservation projects. And we were very excited about this. And it came to the point where we were going to, uh, legislation was going to be introduced to pass a bond for that $4 million when uh, the county commissioners, our bosses at the time, we were a citizen committee uh, reporting to the county commissioners, the three of them, and this was a time when counties had a little more clout than they do now. I suppose they were threatening uh, the higher up, so uh, county power got weakened. Um, anyway, 
the county commissioners got informed by the Northeast Utilities people that this was a really bad idea and in fact that the Energy uh, Committee should be disbanded because we were a little too left-leaning for their liking. And lo and behold, the county commissioners disbanded the uh, Energy Task Force. So that was the end of that problem, uh, that uh, campaign. So I just wanted to say that in response to developing a non-capitalist uh, enterprise in a capitalist um, system is very challenging. Um, we got close and maybe we'll get close again, but we're still, um, in my opinion, just nibbling around the edges of implementing real energy, um, real energy policy that will be good for both people and the environment. But I'm here to talk about Solarize Waitley, which is a more capitalist um, uh, approach, as you'll see. So let me run through this slideshow very quickly, and then I'll give you some of the facts and figures about how effective Solarize Waitley has been. Um, so let's see if this works. Okay, so I'm gonna go through this quickly because this is RGS, that's Real Good Solar. That was our contractor. The towns, um, the towns in Solarize, Massachusetts had to select a contractor to install systems. The idea being that if the contractor was given enough business by the towns, they were the sole uh, contractor, then they'd be able to reduce their cost and pass the cost savings on to the customers, which in fact did happen to some degree. Um, so anyway, we have all these issues to talk about, um, and this is all about RGS Energy, which probably applies to most energy contractors, uh, and they were gonna provide all this expertise, blah, 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 key solar benefits, um, as we all know, there are benefits to solar energy. We didn't have to uh, learn that from them. Then they gave us some information on solar radiation. Yes, there is solar radiation, and yes, you can convert that energy into hot water or uh, hot air or electricity. Um, and so these are some of the criteria that uh, the ideal solar customer has. And this is a picture of which probably many of you, how many of you have solar PV on your, okay, so you should go to another discussion because you've already done the work. No, I'm kidding. Welcome and good for you. Um, and you others who didn't raise your hand, this is for you too. Um, so anyway, here's, here's the system. And you, you can see all these on the video after the presentation. Um, and they're just, this is more advertising. I was a little, I have to say, I was a little rushed to prepare for this. Um, I was uh, working on preparation for my class, and this is a different subject altogether. Um, so anyway, there's various incentives, uh, depending on the uh, size of the system. And um, you could, uh, we had two ways to do this. You could, you could either buy a system or you could lease a system. So. Uh, I'll, I'll get to that. You could either get a, a power purchase agreement which, in which you uh, gave the utilities or the installer the ownership of the system. They installed it, you didn't get charged, and you got a discount on your electricity bills, okay? But it wasn't your system, which was kind of nice for some people, they didn't have to bother about it. Um, uh, but what you got was a, a savings for your kilowatt hours uh, usage, or you could buy the system. Um, so that's what we, and power purchase agreements. Um, it, it used to, actually, it's a lot better now than it was in the 70s when I was involved in actually building Solar House, uh, where you had to negotiate with the utilities your own rates as an individual up against the utilities. So you were a, a very small Goli uh, David against a very big Goliath. So now it's actually a little easier in that respect. Um, so you get credits. Now this is old information, so I don't know how accurate it is. Maybe Claire Chang back there could uh, correct some of this, uh, update some of this information. Um, and you get SREX, solar renewable energy. No X-rays, see it's old. This is what you, would have gotten in 2014, which is when I was involved in this. So this is kind of old news for me and not even news anymore. Um, 
So anyway, here's some figures. And, and we all know that solar pays, so I'm not going to go through this. Um, uh, let's see. And we have examples. And let's see, we can. Yeah, well, like I say, um, I'm sorry to uh, just throw all this utility propaganda at you, but uh, does it still exist? Does it still exist? No. I think it stopped when the pandemic started, correct? Yeah, okay, so. RGS, well, the people, I put solar in my house like in 20, 2008, and I think that, that company lasted about a year before they got eaten up by somebody else who then got eaten up by somebody else. So this is an example of capitalist competition making life more efficient, I'm told. But I'm a little skeptical, as you might be able to determine. Now, hopefully this link will work, and I'd be very happy. Oh, I don't think it's going to work. It does on my computer. Um, so I'm going to read you some numbers, just to be thorough here. And this is as energy, the whatever it's called. What's the, the uh, CEC, Center for Energy? Clean energy. Clean energy. Good. We like clean energy. So, uh, so Lois Dobbs, the program manager at that institution who runs Solarize, who ran, yeah, out of which Mass Solarize was run, says um, uh, she, these are the aggregate savings in 2013, the uh, 2014 program, which this was about. To date, we've only analyzed all committees per round in aggregate, so not individual households or anything like that. So the data is aggregated. A direct purchase consumer on the average paid $4.12 a, a watt under the program, receiving a savings of $1 a watt. So homeowners got to save a uh, dollar a watt uh, relative to the average system cost in Massachusetts at the beginning of the pr program, which was at that time $5.11 per watt. With the data, I was able to pay, uh, do a quick analysis on Waitley systems only, landing at an average of $4.22 per watt. Total system costs for all 20, how many systems do we have? I think we had 27 systems, um, 661, six, yeah, $661,000. Um, anyway, we get $4.22 uh, per watt, very close to the overall average. Um, Waitley had a little more complicated systems than other towns. By the way, we did this, it was not just Waitley, it was Waitley, and uh, Williamsburg and Chesterfield were part of this group, the three towns, because we were too small, so they grouped us together to make it a more reasonable uh, program, which I thought was a good idea. And it was really great meeting my neighbors and our, our peers from surrounding towns so we could organize. It reminded me a little of the Energy Task Force again, where we had 27 people meeting every month from 27 towns talking about how do we, how do we get to a clean energy future by 2000. So anyway, we're not that ambitious here uh, by a long shot, but we did work together, and we did manage to get in Waitley 27 uh, installations, which Waitley has about 600 households. So 27 is not insignificant. Um, What we did as part of Solarize, our big push was a group of us, my colleagues from the Energy Committee, John Edwards and Nat Fortune and others, and uh, our colleagues from Williamsburg and Chesterfield were able to um, uh, develop a campaign and we got $2,500 from the state to develop a campaign to convince people to use RGS. So we were basically hawking for a private company to put solar stuff on their PVs on, on their houses. And, um, and so we, we, we met with some success. Um, Lois calculated the average system size in Waitley to be about 7.5 kilowatts, which is pretty high, I think, but okay. 
Um, so the cost, the average cost in Waverly was about $31,000 compared to the average industry cost at the time of the program, um, which would have been $38,000. So there was a 6,000 savings, roughly. And uh, so there was a measure of success. Uh, and I think um, I'm running out of time, but I wanted to draw the distinction between uh, a more directly political effort to uh, solarize uh, Franklin County with a much smaller effort to solarize a, a small town using uh, a, a private contractor. And I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from that, and maybe we can learn from what you all are doing. Um, and I could go on and talk about another project that my friend Claire in the back and I are very familiar with, but we don't have time, and that's for another day. But that's all I got time for. Any questions about anything? Yes. When you said $4 a lot, is that a nameplate projected install power? Or what, what is I think yeah. we're talking install cost. Yeah, it's install cost. Yeah. I don't know what I paid for mine, but that was a long time. So that's, so what um, Paul's saying is that's where the cost in 2014. The costs now are closer to $3 a month. And it's DC, not AC. Okay, so uh, no more questions. This is good. It's a little like class after I explain something. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? And then I'll sit there. Are you kidding me? I don't have any idea what you said, but I'm not going to ask you a question. Uh, anyway, I'm sure you know more about this than I do at this point, but thank you for listening. Keep up the good work, everybody out here who's doing anything to... Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, uh, I'm a little unclear on whether you are for the Solarize program. I mean, it, it came up as Save money. I have a jaundiced view of a program, but for lack of a better alternative, I'm all for it. Yeah. But I'm also all for developing a better alternative, which we have tried to do. Claire and I and others tried to develop a real solar co-op, uh, a big solar co-op. And we ran into, guess what, the utility problems. <laughs> the, the interconnect uh, cost would have been close to half a million dollars, which killed us. And we couldn't get straight long-term capital on investments um, who needed re guaranteed returns on investments for several years into the future. We couldn't, we couldn't guarantee that. So we got sunk by the financiers and the utilities. So that's what was really stopping renewable energy. It has nothing to do with the fact that people don't want it or it doesn't work. It has all to do with money and politics. I hate to be so simple. Yeah. Uh, just, you know, my understanding is that the new EOR smart program, you know, to summarize, which is you, you were putting up the old S track program. Yeah. But it's it's twenty years instead of ten years, and it's a guaranteed return. And it was changed to encourage more commercial solar because the commercial guys were having a hard time dealing with the unreliable returns on the old S track program. Okay. And so and I think it's no coincidence that now we have a lot of very large solar projects tending to be built around Franklin County. And uh, unfortunately, those all then require a lot of trees to get cut down. And oh, yeah. The war is on. Well, we have what's called industrial solar, right? Uh, but the problem is solar does have to be of a certain scale. Uh, and we need more solar, not less. So, you know, you're raising a very thorny issue that we can have all conference about, right? Uh, one more. So, but, the, but to address your, the smart incentive, so it works for the larger developers because it is 20 years. 25 and under kilowatts, though, it's only a 10-year program. And it's already into negative values now. So it's a declining block. We're in block 9, 10, and 11. It depends on what utility you're in. So for the big guys, yes, they're still getting some margin. But actually, it's the adders, low-income adder, Ag dual use agricultural adder, parking lot brownfields adder um, that make the finances work. Um, but it's also there, the financiers are requiring 10% return on investment. I mean, they're capitalists. These are the big billion dollar guys out there. 
And that's the problem, is, is that we're dependent on their tax equity, which is why we need the refundability in the Build Back Better bill. So you all have to call your senators and congresspeople immediately, especially out of the state of Massachusetts, but including Warren and Markey, and tell them to move the Build Back Better bill. It's got to pass by July 4th. I think that was the deadline in order for the August recess or it won't have any impact this year. Thank you, Paul. Um, so our third speaker um, is Zara Dowling, um, is a research fellow with UMass Clean Energy Extension, and she's going to be talking about community planning and action for solar. Uh, Zara uh, is a is at UMass Clean Energy Extension, where her work focuses on addressing the effects of renewable energy development on wildlife, as well as community level planning for clean energy and carbon neutrality. Among other roles, she oversees the Clean Energy Extension's pollinator friendly certification program for solar arrays. She earned her PhD in 2018, studying approaches to minimize, minim minimize the effects of offshore wind energy development on bats. She is a member of her Town Energy Committee and Conservation Commission in New Salem. So, Zara. Oh, we got some. Hey, everybody. So, while it's uh, while the presentation's coming up, um, yeah. So, I'm at UMass Clean Energy Extension, which, if you guys have. Uh, done work at the municipal level on energy or energy efficiency. You might have heard of us before. We do a lot of uh, applied research and outreach and a lot of municipal technical assistance to towns. And um, one thing I'm going to be talking about today is our new community planning for solar toolkit, which we're going to roll out this month. Um, so there's my, oh, yeah, so there's my little slide about our program. Um, and, but I'm going to, before I jump into our toolkit, I just wanted to provide a little bit of background on sort of solar across the state, where things are, where they're headed. Uh, and since it's a 15 minute presentation, I'll be really briefly. But um, you may have heard, as we were discussing earlier, there were the SREC, pro what were commonly called the SREC programs, right? So those were solar incentive programs that the state of Massachusetts had, SREC, and then what they called SREC 2. Now we're on to the smart solar incentive program. Under those programs, about 3,300 megawatts of solar have been built to date. Um, and we don't know exactly where we're heading with how much solar we're going to need. Um, but if we're going to get to net zero by, you know, at least by 2050 or whenever we're going to get, whenever we're going to try to get to net zero, we're going to need a lot of solar to contribute to that. Um, and so how much solar are we talking about? It depends on who you ask, like who's doing the estimation. Um, and obviously, different people have different uh, kind of assumptions they're making in their projections. But the Brattle Group uh, suggested that for New England by 2050, we're going to need just over 100, so 100, just over 100,000 megawatts, so 100 gigawatts of solar across the region. Massachusetts uses about 50% of the region's electricity, so that would mean about 50,000 megawatts in Massachusetts if we were sort of carrying our fair share, which you could make the argument, well, we've got a lot of offshore wind, maybe Maine should have more solar, they got more land, you know, however you want to divide it up. But if we were going to take our share, that would be about 50,000 megawatts. If you look at the Stanford Solutions Project, they're talking about 38,000 megawatts for the state. Um, if you look at the National Renewable Energy Lab, they're saying we're in the 30,000 to 70,000 megawatts range. And this is including offshore wind, it's including onshore wind, it's including a lot of energy efficiency efforts, it's including energy storage. So this isn't to give you an exact number, but to say we're at 3,300 megawatts, we probably need at least 10 times what we're talking about now. So that's a lot of solar, right? And we already have a lot of uh, concerns about the solar development that's occurring, a lot of which we've just talked about, right? So one of those issues is land use conflicts. Um, people are concerned about the trade-offs between putting solar arrays on natural areas and all of the benefits that those are providing from an environmental perspective, a wildlife perspective, carbon storage, um, you know, recreation, conservation, aesthetics, and similarly with farmland, right? We've got, we want, we're really interested in local food production. Um, and so there's a lot of conflicts and concerns that people have. 
that's on the land use side. I don't have a slide for it, but I also wanted to mention the equity issues, which Ernesto really um, talked about today. And also, you know, the, there's equity issues from the perspective of like low income access to solar and access to solar ownership. There's also sort of the equity issues of a large developer with deep pockets coming into a small town and a small town that doesn't want to get involved in a lot of litigation, right? So it's like, who's getting the benefits of those, of those projects? Um, and so kind of coming out of that, from my perspective, we need to have a lot of solar by 2050, right? I'm, an, I'm a biologist. I want, I want us to have that solar uh, installed and in place, but we also can't get everybody tired of solar already because they're seeing all of their forests cut down for solar panels. So sort of like how do, we, how do we balance those needs? How do we get solar developed and not have people get tired of it now when we need to develop solar for the next 30 years? Um, so one of the things that at UMass Clean Energy Extension we were thinking about is how do we change the way that uh, solar, solar, especially large solar projects, are being built in a community. So right now, typically what happens is that a developer selects a site based on interconnection costs and based on where they can find a large parcel of land with a landowner that's willing to sell or lease them the land. Um, and so then they come to the town with a pre-prepared project, right? This is exactly where we want to build it. This is how big it's going to be. And they have to negotiate through bylaws and permitting, but that's, that's the typical model. Um, and so our thought was, can we change this from a model where the towns are just reacting to these projects coming in at them to say, let's plan up front. Okay, we see what's going to happen over the next 30 years. How can we make a plan to do this well and to benefit benefit the community and align with community preferences. So this is the toolkit that we came up with. Um, as we were thinking about these ideas, we were lucky enough that the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, which is a federal agency, had a uh, grant program through their Solar Energy Innovation Network, specifically targeted at rural communities and solar in rural communities. So um, we were able to obtain that grant funding to work on developing this toolkit. So the, like I said, the idea was to provide tools for communities to kind of, from a proactive perspective, walk through solar planning, think about what they wanted. And to be clear, this toolkit is not to advocate for solar or solar everywhere or anything like that, but it's the idea is like, let's find out what the community wants and figure out a plan to the extent practicable to achieve that, that goal. Keeping in mind that there are limitations on what communities can do under current state law in terms of their bylaws and so forth. We had a great project team. We uh, Co-op Power, who talked earlier, is, was one of our members. Um, but we also worked with three pilot communities, Blandford, Wendell, and West Hampton, two regional planning agencies, uh, local uh, developers and financiers. So UMass Five College Credit Union provides a lot of small uh, solar loans. Uh, Co-op Power, as I said, PV Squared, Northeast Solar, um, and also a number of state agencies. And so the steps that we ultimately came up with um, were, first of all, obviously you've got to put together a planning committee as happens with most, most planning processes. So I'm not gonna to talk too much about that, but you wanna get organized, set, set timelines and goals for what you're gonna accomplish over what time period. Um, and then the second step that we came up with was to do a solar resource and infrastructure assessment so that we're really grounded in what can actually occur in your community. Uh, you know, reviewing from just looking at existing documents, what bylaws are already in place, what community planning documents are already in place. You know, I've been thinking a lot about open space and recreation plans and how in some ways they're sort of the flip side of a solar plan, right? It's like this is where we don't want to develop and this is where we may think development is a good idea. Um, and just talking with other municipal representatives and get a sense of what information they know about. And then there's a lot of great publicly available data uh, so the utilities are required to provide electricity grid infrastructure information, which can help you understand where large developments are more likely to go in the near future, um, what renewable energy facilities already exist, what businesses and farms, how many households, how big are their roof areas, how many tax parcels, and so forth. Um, and also, there's a lot of geospatial data layers, so you can actually get an estimate of the size of all those roof areas, um, the size of parking lots, and so forth. Uh, where what parts of town are already per permanently protected, uh, what land might be of conservation value through a number of different metrics. So there's a lot of information you can just get without going out on the ground. Um, and so our, our toolkit walks you through this process. 
This is just some images from that. Uh, the yellow is all impermeable surfaces. So this is a, and the black is roof print. So that big black uh, structure is a roof uh, of the high school in West Hampton and then the parking lot area behind that. So you can use that to kind of estimate what's the maximum solar potential you would have in that area. And I'm sure Karen would tell us that the amount of the parking lot canopy that you can put in is actually, there's a lot more complicated factors. So this is really sort of an upper limit on like, what's the most that you could put on that particular space? And then you have to delve into the details. Um, but anyway, so that's sort of some of the areas that might be already developed areas you could put solar. And then you can look at the town as a whole and say, what are areas that are already conserved? That's the areas with hash, hatch lines in this picture, that little area in red is an agricultural preservation um, restriction. And then the areas in green are Biomap 2, which is a data layer from the state that is uh, for priority wildlife habitat. Um, and then obviously all the blue is uh, rivers and streams and wetlands. So that's just to give you a sense of that second step. The third step we looked at was get to thinking through solar financing options, ownership structures, and potential community benefits. And I think other people have really touched on this. Um, there are a lot of different economic benefits that can come from solar, right? And it might be as simple as pilot payments to the town, could be reduced electricity rates, could be the solar incentive payments, which are now smart payments. And the, But who gets those benefits changes depending on the ownership structure. Um, and so there's a lot of different factors involved for individual projects. Uh, and so one thing that definitely came out of this project for us, which I think other people have touched on, is that there's a lot more work needed to make local ownership structures, particularly for larger projects, viable and easily accessible to towns or community groups, especially because of the way the tax credit for solar is set up at the moment. Um, but anyway, so to make sure that we, we think through all the different community benefits that are possible in the community and what structures for different size projects might be viable. Um, and our director, Dwayne Breger, is a, he's an expert in resource economics, and so he was able to figure out a cash flow model that could show you under different ownership structures where that, where that wealth from the solar project goes. Um, and so you might have a project where there's a third party developer, they have to put a lot of that uh, money in up front whereas the community doesn't have to put any money in up front and also doesn't have to do the, all the logistical work, but then most of that money is flowing out of the local community. There's probably some through a local land lease and a pilot payment, but a lot of that's flowing out through to the community, uh, from the community. On the other hand, if you have a community-owned project, there's a lot of money that the town or the community has to come with up front, but then they get all of those financial benefits. Um, and in the middle, you have a third-party flip model where you work with a developer, they put in that initial investment and then they get the tax benefits out of it, but then they can sell it to a community um, or municipal group at a discounted rate. So that's, that's sort of an in the middle option. So there's more work that we, need to, that we all need to do on this to find models for ownership, but that's one of the aspects of this project that we're trying to work through. So after considering community benefits, um, <laughs> we were looking at uh, thinking about the alternatives, right? So we've talked about uh, how, where people want, like where it's possible to pull, po where it's possible to put solar in the town. How much solar is it possible to put um, in the community? How do people want the regulation process and the permitting process to go? Um, where, if there is going to be development on undeveloped spaces, what kind of areas do people prefer or would not like to see development occur? And then, like I said, what, what community benefits and ownership structures are people most interested in? So thinking about all the different alternatives from the status quo of we're not regulating to try to have a certain amount of growth to do we want to have a self-sufficient town? Do we want to say our goal is we want to you know, build enough solar in our community to supply our energy needs now and into the future? Or, oh, sorry, or I guess what we just <laughs> heard about last time, an idea from the 70s or 80s of like, do we want to try to have a region that is at least support providing enough electricity for Western Mass and perhaps exporting outside of uh, this region. So thinking sort of statewide and saying if we were going to have enough solar for to meet state goals, that would mean that basically 4%, uh, if, we, if we made an average across the state, 4% of the land area in every town would have to be developed for solar. That's including 
<coughs> on rooftops or on disturbed areas or on undeveloped areas. So just understanding what the range of options are, um, what the range of development types are and what some of the associated costs are with that, and what are the different types of greenfield development if you are gonna develop on undeveloped spaces, does the community want that to occur next to a major road so it's not fragmenting a forest or is it out of sight, out of mind, we don't wanna see it? Um, is it one big project or is it several, several smaller projects uh, around town? So once we have an idea of what are actually re realistic different development options in the community, um, we have a solar community solar survey that with our pilot communities went out to all of the members of the community to participate in, weigh in on all of those issues. And we actually also did focus groups ahead of time to get a sense of what were the main issues that people were talking about, what terminology they were using, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna try to be, <laughs> be quick. But uh, bringing that all together after we get the solar survey back, analyze those results, understand what people want in the community, using that to develop a community solar action plan to say, here's the resources that are available, here's the different potential ownership structures that are available, here's what we know from the survey about what people want, so how do we put those into action? And that might be putting, including updates to solar bylaws or ordinances that say, try to direct solar development to the types and the locations that people prefer it might be pursuing specific projects on municipal land or buildings if there's strong support for the town actually investing in solar. It might be campaigns like Solarize Mass if it comes back or a similar model of just saying, let's try to get as many households in town to put solar on the roofs as possible um, to promote rooftop projects or business, you know, projects on businesses. Um, and it might be working if there are certain types of land or disturbed sites or even undeveloped sites that are kind of ranking lower in people's preferences uh, to say, can we work with interested private landowners to actually encourage development on those locations and avoid development on these other locations? Um, so that's, our, that's the toolkit process that we put together. Uh, all of those tools are gonna be available on our website this month pending final <laughs> Department of Energy review and approval. And um, what we're planning for this fall is to put together a class with UMass seniors to actually help towns through this toolkit process. Um, so we're a really small team and we wanna help everybody. Bigger towns who have like a, some kind of sustainability position might be able to have somebody just work through the toolkit on their own, but we're thinking that smaller communities might need more support. So if you're interested in this for your town, uh, get in touch with me and we'll, we'll try to make it happen with the capacity that we have. Uh, we also have a lot of other solar resources on our website, which are, uh, I provide some links to there. And this is my contact information if you wanna get in touch. So sorry for that bit of a whirlwind, but happy to take questions briefly. <laughs> yes. I was, in my, I mean, it depends who's. Is farmland considered to be developed? Who's asking, yeah, he asked if farmland's considered to be developed in the way, I mean, I guess it depends who you talk to. In the way I was referring to it, I was considering it undeveloped land. But it kind of, I mean, I think in this state, people often think of it as undeveloped land. Um, but in other states where there's a lot more larger farms and it's a little bit more industrial agriculture, I think people often think of it in more of a class of developed land. But in, in this, I was referring to it as undeveloped. Ashfield, yeah. The road, there's more trees than there are farmland. Yeah. And so there's a sense of farmland being very precious. Yeah, yeah, and I think when you look across the state, there's a lot of forested land. And so when we go into these towns and we look at what the development options are, <laughs> there really isn't, there's not usually, there's often not a lot of land that isn't, isn't forested, right? So that's something which is part of just understanding what is feasible in a community. Um, yeah. Uh, this is a very toolkit. Thank you very much for introducing it. Um, I don't know if it's too late, but could you please add a risk assessment step in your desktop? Because you know we're, we're moving right down to another silo approach to climate planning, where mitigation is separate from the risk assessment of what climate impacts might actually affect the very development you're talking about. So to avoid that, to use you know all of the stuff that's available from the Massachusetts uh, you know MVP program and so on, on the risks that people face, so that you don't place your solar development right into a puzzle where it's going to be impacted by 
large-scale solar, when you get to that stage, there are a lot of GIS layers that you can look at. Yeah, you know, wind issues, I mean, all the rest of it. Don't underestimate how that can impact to Yeah. How do you understand what 4% of the state of Massachusetts looks like? In other words, what percentage of the land is currently covered by a house? Or what percentage of the land is currently paved over? That, that's a very good... The, yeah, that's a very good question, and I have a slide that we've used in other presentations that shows what that amount of land would be, just like relative to the whole state, but I don't have that in this presentation. Um, and I don't know off the top of my head the percentages of like covered land, but you actually can look it up for the state and your community. Mass Audubon has a really great losing ground report that shows the amount of development of different types um, and you can get numbers for your town, your county, or the state, which might be helpful. Yeah. Um, one thing I am very vague about, but we ran into a little bit, there was a, a, aside from just the space available to put solar, there is also a utility restriction that you have to be able to offload that power within a certain district. Right? So I think maybe you're talking about interconnection issues. Is that yeah? So interconnection is a huge issue, and it's it's basically what is driving a lot of large development. And one thing that we're hoping through this model, because you know as was talked about at the very beginning, there's going to be a lot of grid modernization that has to occur. And one thing that I would like to see is if the if towns are able to say. This is the part of town that we don't want to see developed because it has a lot of wildlife and conservation and aesthetic value and there's farmland and whatever. But there's actually some areas down here that was an old landfill and a gravel pit and we would like to see development occur down here, but the grid isn't built out well enough there. Can we actually direct our grid modernization efforts to say, this is where you should build out and like what would be the, you know, it probably is going to cost a little bit more to, to build out the grid based a little bit more on conservation than just on what's the cheapest place to build out the grid, right? But but it has a lot of other benefits. It also yeah. Had to do with the use that people had to offload power. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like Karen. Did you want to speak to that? Yeah, or well, I, I, I don't want to open that can of worms. I just okay. want to ask a question about um, you know it, it, the reduction of consumption. As, as a very important foundation of this discussion, yeah. municipal, municipality by municipality. And I'm wondering to what extent, if at all, hopefully a good extent, is UMass Clean Energy Extension engaged with ISO and Wakeland and, and having greater transparency? Because I know that the utilities are, their business model is, model is all about more and more and more consumption. It has to be the other way around. And, and having that dialogue, I think, is going to is going to bring more transparency and more clarity around yeah. solutions. So, so all of those numbers I showed you at the beginning were based on a lot of energy efficiency. They were based on really increasing our energy efficiency. But even considering that, with if we make all our vehicles electric and we put in air source heat pumps, the thought is that for a lot of basically our electricity use across the state, which has not been really going up, is going to double because you're going to have be powering everything off of the electric grid, right? So even under a scenario where we're extremely energy efficient, we're going to need to really increase our electricity uh, production, as you know, to meet that. Um, and so when we, we did rough calculations for these towns, and like I said, across the state, the thought is it's going to be two times the amount of electricity demand we have right now. But with these communities, they're rural, and so people are driving further than they are in cities. And you know, another good uh, argument for increasing public transportation, but they are, people are driving more. And so the numbers we're seeing are more like two and a half or three times the amount of electricity that people are currently using. Um, yeah. Um, I know that Holyoke has a, a, a city-owned power production. And I'm wondering what the possibilities are for the local, instead of having, I mean, you could feed into the grid, but, but having local, local yeah, and local power production and not having to, you know, distribute power over long, long, long distances all the time. You know, local power just makes so much 
Yeah, and I mean, at the moment, Holyoke has a really unique position, right? Because they've got the Holyoke Dam. Um, yeah. But it's yes, yes. Uh, yeah, and I guess I would just say those distribution lines are typically owned either by one of the large electric u electrical utilities or a municipal utility. So that infrastructure, at least currently, is owned by utilities except for towns that have a municipal utility. Um, so there, yeah, there are certainly options to do microgrids and to incorporate energy storage and to, and you know, part of this is just to understand what do people want as a starting point? Like, do they, are they comfortable with enough development to achieve energy self-sufficiency as a community? Or maybe not, maybe they don't want to even see that amount of development, or maybe they do want to export and have a business. How does the community have to be Well, that's why I hope they'll sign on. Who's <laughs> our tool to start understanding that? Yeah, is where there, as you can see, there are other tracks. Uh -huh. Exactly. Yeah. So I think this makes a lot of sense, and I really appreciate all the work that you've done on it. So the problem is our rural communities out here um, have a very different energy profile than, let's say, Boston or even mid-sized cities. And so, and it doesn't include very much industrial or manufacturing or any of those kinds of loads. And even though we're rural out here, we still depend on those um, uh, businesses and operations. So I think we need to help contribute to that capacity building. Um, is that something that's included in how you're looking at? Yeah, and so when we, uh, if I can, I don't know if I can go, does it go back to that slide? So when we did, you know, depending on if, if we're working through the toolkit with a town um, and putting together that solar survey, we, we have a template which towns can adapt. So they could adapt it and say, we're not even, we don't want to include that in our survey. But in our survey, when we talk about solar development options, one of them is capacity. And one of the things we say is like, do you want just town self-sufficiency? But when we talk about the model of regional self-sufficiency, we say, well, hey, you know, you're going to Greenfield, you know, if you live in a rural community, you're probably going to Greenfield for groceries, for medical appointments, what have you. Um, similarly, if you think about the state as a whole. So yeah, that is encapsulated in our descriptions that are included in that survey so that people are, are thinking about that when they're making those decisions or making, you know, saying, stating their preferences. Um, but obviously, depending on who works through the toolkit, they could be like, we're throwing that question out the window or we're re rephrasing it or what have you, so. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah.